We are doing Pumka. Pumka. Claps. Okay. You have to clap too. All together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whenever you guys are ready, I'm ready to Pumka. Okay. <laughs> Pumka. Okay. Just look away. Like I couldn't even. <laughs> Ridiculous. I can keep a smile on my face, soaking wet. Ready, go! I think we got it, though. I think we're gonna do fine. Did you think she was gonna be here? We've got a great team of people that are all really ambitious, and we'll make it. We'll make it happen. How she moved in the past and how it's like movement is really typical of animals. So I'm actually like pretty familiar with a lot of these areas and could cut across. So for the next nine days, uh, starting tomorrow morning, we're going to follow the path of Doe 139. That's Sam Dwinnell. She's a research scientist for the University of Wyoming. She studies a herd of mule deer that call Western Wyoming home. Sam worked for the team of scientists to put radio collars on does and their fawns. These big-eared beauties are an iconic Western species, and over the last 50 years, with an increase in human presence on the land, the population has been in decline. Sam and her colleagues are studying what about an animal's environment determines their survival. Ever since I started on this project, I've wanted to follow the migration of one of our study animals. Also, like, I thought it sounded like a really sweet adventure. We're gonna go on this ridge and just to, I mean, we wanna be safe. Sam recruited so, me, my name's Tennessee Watson, and her friend you know, Anya Tyson along on this journey. But the real star of the show is Deer 139. Deer 139 is a badass for sure. <laughs> yeah. She undergoes this really incredible journey during migration, going from winter range that's really dry desert, and she moves north into the foothills on the east side of the Wyoming range and just kind of bounces back and forth in and out of the foothills, up and over ridges goes up into Horse Creek, and then that's when she starts her climb up and over the crest of the Wyoming Range, cruises from Blind Bull down into the Grays River, where she then traverses north again, goes up into the headwaters of Murphy Creek, pops over that, where it overlooks Star Valley. There's like a, a beautiful alpine cirque up there that she spends her summer at. The most mind-blowing detail about that whole journey is 139 does it on the verge of giving birth. Deer 139 takes six weeks to migrate. Sam wants to bang this out in nine days. Okay. Struggle. Round two of the struggle. We're going to climb Packroft and ski our way 85 miles from Deer 139's winter range to her summer range. Got it. I don't know. Sound ridiculous? Got it. It is ridiculous. <laughs> you know? Oh no, I got it. I'm just gonna wait on that. I'm pretty sure I can do it. It's about science and our desire for a crazy adventure. <sighs> it's <just> really heavy. <laughs> going on this expedition with Anya Tyson. She is a field naturalist, maybe the most charismatic person I know. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna lie that uh, an outdoor adventure with, with my buddy Sam Donnell is something that I wouldn't pass up. Uh, Tennessee Watson, a really talented investigative reporter, 
their line? I am by uh, no means an expert on wildlife or nature, but I'm a generally curious <laughs> human being. So I think that's my special role in this trip. Um, the only reason why Tennessee is coming, honestly, is because uh, she made a deer costume <laughs> for the trip. And uh, we just need her as like, you know, the obligatory deer acting out what, what, we, what we think deer are doing. It's not bad. I can't pick it up, but I can walk. Not pressing. We have everything, skis, boots, poles. Clean underwear? Clean, clean underwear. You don't wear underwear though, so. <laughs> I'm excited to be completely surprised by something. I think that this week might change my life and I don't want to put too heavy of expectation on it, but I just think to go out in the woods to really get off of trails. I've always followed a path that other humans have walked. I'm also honestly concerned that maybe we'll do it and it'll be easy. And we'll be like, huh, all right, well, that's cool. <laughs> that doesn't do it. I'm not sure. I thought it started. It's oh, mother You've got to be kidding me. Let me just walk. Yeah, walk Let me just out. walk it out. Walk around. I yeah, take your time. I don't know where we should a wild fruit to offer you. <laughs> what the hell did I even trip on? I think I just rolled my ankle. Um, car's right there where we started. Anyway, you can let, let rest up. Okay. For sure. This is supposed to be the easy part of the journey. These rolling, sage-covered hills are more hospitable than the rugged mountains we're headed towards. Deer hang here in the winter, living off dwindling fat reserves and sage twigs, because that's better than chest-deep snow. But this land has some limitations. Deer 139's winter range has a lot of energy development on it. There's overwhelming science that shows that they don't like it. They don't react well to it. As we cross extensive networks of hoof prints, it's clear how deer are packed into these spaces in the winter. You might see them near rigs and well pads and assume everybody's playing nice. But the reality is that these deer have nowhere else to go. Their survival depends on being loyal to a specific patch of land. Familiarity with its contours feeds them, and when a rig pops up, the deer will steer clear, limiting their access to available food. Oh, got it gooped on me. Uh -oh. oh, I'm actually not vicious. Oh. The mark of people on the land continues beyond energy development. Well, we just gonna have to pass our packs over. <laughs> that would feel good. Oh, shit. oh, hold up. There we go. I'm gonna go this way. Oh, look at that. Am I, am I twerking? Is this twerking? Woo! Oh, yeah. oh Sam! 
But yeah, the fences are a pain in the ass. <laughs> I think that's pretty apparent. Yeah, deer can jump over them, but they don't always make it. Landowners can space wires so animals can get through. That linear movement is capturing her moving alongside this fence. And some even laid down their fences during migration. And it's still, I mean, every time we approach a fence, it seems like, uh, I mean, we obviously don't panic, but we're just like, oh, God, another thing that we have to deal with. Like, oh, this is such a pain. And I, I would imagine that the animals are kind of the same. else thought that was going to be just a mellow field. We actually want to be just like on the other side of this here. Oh. Oh, I was thinking. Yeah, sorry, I was following. Okay. So, yeah, what do we want to do? We can hop up on this Black Canyon Road here and then just cut back. After traversing only seven and a half miles of relatively flat terrain, each step came with doubt about completing Deer 139's six-week journey in just nine days. Oh, Are you well. worried about this, Sam? Uh, yeah, I am worried about it. I mean, I've sprained, I've sprained my ankle before but it's never been in a situation where I haven't been able to rest it. Yeah. Got a, a rig worker pulling up. Morning. Someone was saying you had a little fire. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't have a fire. A fire. Okay. We had, we used gas cook we stoves. We used cook stoves. Okay, just, we got gas wells here. If that drifts over and you guys got any kind of open flame, okay, it wouldn't be a good deal. Okay. So you guys are plumb fine here, but I just want to let you guys know that something could possibly happen if there was anything. Just be careful. And, awesome. Thank right, you. You guys Thank take you. care. We'll yeah, see. you too. Have a good one. Okay. Done? I think so. I feel oh, like yeah. kind of like well, I... That might become... You might want to... You want that. I haven't walked behind Blue Sea yet. I feel like I really have any connection with Delilah. Yeah. Yep. Here's some plaques coming up. There's quite a bit of diversity out here. Yeah, it's surprising actually. All oh, this lichen. Liking it. Get it? She's not here. No. Did you think she was gonna be here? Well, I thought maybe there was a chance we could hear her. This is definitely where one of her stopovers is. And she was up on top yesterday, but can't hear her now. And she's probably just hunkered down somewhere in the snow. It's not that she's left. It's that she's like in some place where you can't hear her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anymore. Okay. Yeah. It was 
find glass in from this spot. <laughs> nice. It's pretty cool to see a moose out there. We're miles behind schedule, and we call in support as the reality sets in that we've got lots to learn from 139 about how to pace ourselves. Uh, because we moved, yeah, from there to there is all we were able to do today. Yeah. Just know how to be maybe slightly more efficient, maybe. We probably want to, this is a big mountain, so maybe we can only make it to there. So we need to get there then if we, yeah. one, two, three. Oh, uh, we're gonna end up breaking this expedition up into two parts. Mostly we're moving so much slower than we thought. We had planned 13 mile days. We're breaking all of our days in half. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we were just trying to ski and just trying to hike, we'd just put our heads down and walk. Yeah. If we stuck with plan A, like we really would be going through terrain, like snow depths that she doesn't deal with and we'd be mm -hmm. way ahead of her. And I think it's cool to be able to come back and revisit that second half of the journey when 139 is actually like close to being in that mm -hmm. that terrain mm -hmm. um so yeah since we're not going to be skiing in this part i think we'll ditch our skis <laughs> which sucks you're disappointed about this <laughs> i'm very disappointed yeah, about it we have some disappointment but we're being true to the deer we're trying to tell the story of this place we essentially we're just breaking we By splitting our trip in two, we're actually more in sync with Deer 139's movements. We get to slow down and experience the land's <laughs> transition from winter to spring. This is the, the creme de la creme for deer. Geranium is what comes out like number one in their diets throughout the summer. Uh, super nutritious, high digestibility, high protein content. Oh. Tastes terrible. Yeah. Don't eat it. Yeah. Actually, I wouldn't recommend it. I'm gonna do it despite. Oh. Oh wow, that I is really you. bad. We have to actually go this way first because she kind of goes north. We're here to learn from the path, not to conquer it. That peak that's just above the aspens there. The angle of the light makes a total difference on how easy it is to see the tracks. This is the good one. How David Attenborough does sometimes. Um, I wish I could do an English accent. <laughs> Out here in Wyoming, we have mountain lions and deer that are at an arms race to outrun the other. <laughs> I don't think that's really David Attenborough. -y. <laughs> All right. They were following this track here. You can see some pretty good prints here. So you've got Mom, mom's print is right here. So mom, mama mountain lion here. You can see her kitten track here and her track again here. And she's moving off that way and very near where 139 will move um, right along her path. I would presume that predators can, can key in on animal movements and sort of target these animals along their migration corridors and so it is risky for these animals we we see a slight uptick in the mortalities they're not only
trying to find the good green up. But they also have all of these constraints for where they can go, like predators, as well as just trying to escape people. The only way they can exist out here is by being connected and, and essentially having the knowledge of the landscape that we, we no longer have as humans. Anya, is that a double fence? For sure? Frickin' double fence. Why? Guys! Hey guys! Just jump over it, Delilah. No, too high! You can go under! Uh... I have to take my backpack off. <laughs> Can you help me? You wanna go under? Yeah. Be still. Aren't you? Oh, oh. <laughs> you did it! Yay. You did well, it! My darling, your anxious heart is well bestowed. Oy, oy. I'd pictured Wyoming's rich wildlife populations in the mountains, but most wouldn't exist without the sage. I mean, for me as a scientist, it's important to see migration firsthand, and it does just give me a better understanding of all of the moving parts that they're trying to, to balance. It's been really nice for me to get out of the saddle of, we need to make miles. Like we're moving at the pace that we're moving. And we're learning more about this landscape and appreciating it more and breathing more as a result. Sorry, that might have not been best for some photography. So, you have a good grip on that. And I can't imagine what it's like for the deer swimming across those rivers. Tell me when you're ready. I think the point that was where I like felt my heart race and my like armpits get extra sweaty. No. Some like dumb panicky stuff was that first time that we pack rafted. Take the ice axe off of it before we put it in the boat. Holy sh! You know, yeah. Just because it feels so stupid to cross moving water when the sun is going down. Where's, where's the big group? Of course. Where's the big group that's close to the river right now? They were like, they came down the conifers here. Did they all come uh, down there? Then duck down. I don't know, I just saw a few of them. I don't know if they... I'll go try to throw it up. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to the road and try. But it's empty. All morning we've been seeing waves of different groups of animals moving through this hillside. And we clearly timed it right where we're moving with with a lot of these animals right now. It's pretty cool to see. We watch a steady stream of deer pick their way towards us. Maybe one of them is 139. It, it seems like we're getting things right. Uh, it it kind of locks it in. This isn't just a silly thing that we're doing. We're really witnessing an uh, event that is so important to this landscape. Got some freshies. We're hot on the trail, guys. Oh yeah, pretty hot. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. The bath, bath water warm. Yeah. Deer 139 would take us 
into the mountains. I'm not sure who it is, but I think it's maybe Deer 89, because she summers right in this area, in the Thompson Peak area. And 139 goes through the same area, but she doesn't stop here. She just keeps keeps on going. The reason why she takes the path that she does is because it's the path that her mom taught her. And so she follows that. And so if she, if she dies and, and her fawns die, then essentially this route could blink out of existence. We puzzled often about Deer 139's route. They're sort of, in my mind, it's far more interesting, these animals that live in these completely disparate habitats in different times of the year. The walking wasn't easy, and there was no food for the deer here now. But spring is a time of drastic transitions. Somehow, deer know this and time their movements almost perfectly with the pulses of food that emerge from receding snow lines. What I don't get is why she chose to avoid the road further up, but then during this whole stretch, she just cruises right along the road. Is any section of the road less well-traveled? There are far fewer of those little canyons that have those nice conifer aspen mixes. And I wonder if that, that could be part of it too. Just the forage is better up high away from the road, so she chooses to go that route up there. But down here, maybe she just, she's like, ah, I just want the quickest path at this point. There's not much good eating here anyways. Do you think that the thought crossed her mind that, you know, someday a group of silly women is going to follow in my footsteps. I'll just give them a break for a couple miles. Uh, you know, I could see her being considerate like that, actually. <laughs> yeah. What if That's probably it. <laughs> Gotta be it. Mystery solved. <laughs> what about the migration paths predating roads? That actually... There's a magic to how we're navigating this terrain, too. You guys got that one over there, right? Eh? <laughs> Without much discussion, tents go up, water gets filtered, meals get made. Because Wyoming's spring is still freezing cold, we've got the backcountry all to ourselves. Once again, that athleticism component comes in. It's just, wow. That is one thing I've learned is that they crush through terrain in a really powerful way. My assumption was that like there'd be a certain flow to it or a certain ease. And the thing that's really interesting about this is that there's nothing predictable about this route. Oh. <laughs> ben. Oh, he's just busted. I mean, aside from the fence, beautiful views. Which way? Down that way? It's our next river that crossing, way. huh? Three, two, one, dropping! We're invisible. used at first, but the snow just kept going and going and going. Oh, your problem is over there, Anya. 
Yeah. This is definitely my vagina. Snow. Snow up to the vagina. Right now. Being injured, I can't do the things that I normally can do. I, I get frustrated when I'm like, God, I know I can do this. There we go. <laughs> Anya is really great at helping us navigate um, tricky situations. Like she blazes these amazing bushwhacks. She told me yesterday that she loves moving across the land like an animal. There's something out there that looks a little like a skull. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tennessee doesn't give you a hand, she just walks around. I'm really appreciating not being in the driver's seat and experience things that you you couldn't engineer for yourself. It's, it's really nice to just see what Deer 139 has in store for us. Even when we think things will get easier, our descents are covered in downfall and snow. Are we day five, six, four, seven? <laughs> Holy sh! <shit>. Day seven. <laughs> oh man, that goes to show how good of a leader I am. <laughs> Responding to our environment and situation made it so we actually moved alongside the migration. We were in the heart of it. I've seen how many species are all moving together elk and pronghorn and deer all moving together. It's, it's something that, for whatever reason, I'm kind of surprised by. I figured this is just a deer, deer migration corridor, and it's what deer use in elk and pronghorn. They kind of, they all have their own little routes. But actually, a lot of them use the same areas, which for me is pretty important when thinking of landscape conservation and connectivity. I was just appreciating each mule deer more as an individual. Hiking a single doe's route has helped me uh, develop an eye for that. We were like in her company for a while and then moved ahead of her. When we come back at the end of the month, we're gonna be close to synced up with her again. Phase two is the part of the trip that I was most looking forward to. It's the most adventurous part. Honestly, I'm more afraid of the second part of this trip. I know the train is gonna be a lot gnarlier. I, I have no idea how, how she or other animals deal with that. So, but is there anybody else it could be? Uh, one of three. Be, it could be 89. Oh, let me turn Come the light bulb on here. Oh, wow. There's 139? Yeah. What? And that meant that 139 passed us while we were at camp. Yeah. So that's her 6 a.m. point, and that's her 8 a.m. point, and we were camped like right there. So on the night of the first. <laughs> That's six o'clock on the night of the first. So like when we were, when we were crossing the river, the river, she was crossing the river? That's so good. Oh my God. That is insane. We, we just, we passed her and we didn't even know. Maybe she heard us talking about her the whole time. 
you know? Yeah, she wants or to she show us out. Yeah. That's so yeah, funny. Yeah, exa exactly. She's like, how the hell are they going to get across the river? Here we go. Here we go. Together. So this is the part of the trip that I have been looking most forward to. Uh, I'm feeling great. Yeah. Ankle is mostly healed. Anya is mostly recovered from Giardia. Good to go. Good to go. <laughs> and Tennessee's just always ready for anything. Right, Tennessee? Yeah. <laughs> The snow is receding fast. It's full on spring. Even though Anya got Giardia during part one of this adventure and was wiped out for a good part of our three week break, she's powering through. And somehow we still trust her to treat our water and cook all of our food. We're right back into the swing of things. That's what I like try, I try to do like the whole body. I gotta aim though. <laughs> you got it! <laughs> and we're back in sync with the flow of migration. Right where we're crossing, there are were several deer tracks, I think, from this morning, crossing right here where we were crossing. We followed the tracks in the snow, and you can see them going up on the other side over there. Since we don't want to be wet all day, we're all going to be pants. I didn't wear underwear before this trip, but Sam gifted me a beautiful pair of blue Hanes Her Way granny panties. Full coverage, lots of benefits. You can tuck your t-shirt into them and it minimizes chafe from your hip belt. We dip our toes into the cold and mighty Horse Creek. Just on the other side is Blind Bull Pass. In no place has migration been so visible. For many deer other than 139, that snow is the final push before splitting off into their summer homes. Sort of a aha moment for me. Like I always had this idea of, wow, how are these animals post holing through the snow when they're going over these mountain passes? And I think the reality of it is they wait for the snow to firm up. Again, they're so connected with this landscape. They wait for that those isothermic conditions and then they decide to cruise across on the snow. At this point, we're just trailing behind Deer 139 by a couple of days. I'm trying to channel 139. Pretty, I'm trying to be pretty faithful to that. I just know that she wouldn't go up there to look at whatever giant predator yeah, left cool. those tracks. And I, I think at this point, I might be the only one that's actually still on mission. Actually, a disproportionate number of our animals summer in this drainage. Like, this is the greatest density of our collared animals. I guess the reason is, is because it's pretty lush and there's a lot of good eating. So good. Do I have any in my teeth? Their summer ranges are established by where they're born. So their mom basically gives birth to them in these areas and that, that becomes their home. That becomes the place that they come back to year after year. And she cruises up this hill, so I guess we will too.
all these wildflowers and this dance party-worthy scenery might have lulled us into thinking that healthy wildlife populations are a given in a place like this. But there were reminders to the contrary. So that down there, there used to be willows and green things. And I used to see moose there all the time. And then last year they put this. Sam's like- No, no more moose. Sam's like the Lorax of the Wyoming. (laughs) Habitats can't be considered in isolation there is a purpose for each of the habitats that they use along their path. Making sure that we connect those landscapes is is so critical for the survival of the population. What might seem like a beautiful, undisturbed ecosystem at a closer look tells a different story. This area was hit pretty hard by sheep grazing, and the sheep don't find this plant tasty, and so they eat everything around it and mow it down and take care of its competitors so it comes back even stronger. And unfortunately, this plant is also not palatable to elk or mule deer. What's the plant called? Mule's ears. Mule's ears. Mule's ears not beneficial to mule deers. Humans aren't the only thing that alter a migratory path. A few months before our journey, the Grays River Road was wiped out by a landslide. It dammed the Grays River and left a thick, chunky mess. Traversing this is like crossing a giant bowl of gooey chocolate chip cookie dough, but not delicious. There's no shortage of wetness to traverse this portion of the trip. Apparently 139 is one hell of a swimmer. Those young people run around in their booty shorts. They don't know what's proper. This is See, proper river got, attire right it. here. I can't sleep and I don't feel right. I'm caught in the shadows of your land. My t-shirt ain't big a good reason to be staring at me like that. My deep feet ain't got a good reason to be staring at bird are you on? 70. And what is it? Common nighthawk. Nice. Good bird. I like that bird. Was that impressive? Was that a good sign? No. Of the 20 birds that are new to this section, 2, 3, 4, 18. Are migratory birds? Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. You know, I'm a nerdy naturalist, so for me, it's it's important to know the names. Oh, uh, looking for the gray cat bird. Hey, who's that? Got a pine siskin. Or yellow warbler action. I mean, that's often what we do as people. We, oh, hey, what's your name? The next thing you ask is, where are you from? So I want to explode the three birds that I saw over Christmas in New Mexico. Could be the same ones that now. I don't even think about that, like how they're just settling into their summer areas too. Yeah. That curiosity uh, just is it's an opportunity for us to build a relationship with the world around us. Science attempts to keep us in touch with what's going on. We're so far removed from a time when intimate knowledge of a landscape literally spelled life or death. That's that. And so that would mean that we're going to But now we rely on scientific inquiry to understand the natural world. Thought I heard some phantom beeps, but uh, I'm not hearing her here. So she may be up on summer range already. Who knows? With only four miles left, we settled in for the night in the valley of Murphy Creek. Trench foot. These little crinkles that are troublesome because they feel like blisters. Also pretty crinkly. Oh, 
Not here. Hopefully she's on summer range. I think it'll be it would be a really nice end to our journey to to finish it meeting her on her summer range. Uh well I'm not gonna go the way that 139 goes. <laughs> it's it looks pretty gnarly. Her next push looked like a 3,000 foot climb. Which is she just follows it like more so that way. She makes this skin noises as she goes up. The terrain that she covered, you know, that we could see today that we know she covered was really impressive. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of cliffs. We could just go up this because it does look. Yeah. Like so, go to that point and then yeah, the ridge. I wonder if we should walk closer. Size that up. Okay. Let's do that. No. You and Anya are like ready to just follow her exact path. <laughs> the packs are really heavy though. That would be kind of. We got an early start because there was no telling exactly what Deer 139 had in store for us. So we got steep, but uniform, lean into the hill, hug and puff. I don't know, I was worried that I wouldn't feel a connection with her. But I think we were literally walking in her tracks. But I never should have doubted 139's instincts. Every move along her path is deliberate. It's not random. It's learned, passed from mother to daughter, from generation to generation. And while it would have been easier with hooves, the route still worked for us. This is it, guys. <laughs> yeah! We did it! Thank you! Overlooking her summer range, we knew that she had to be just on the other side of the mountaintop. There was no doubt in my mind that she wouldn't be here. Oh, hold on. Oh, I gotta get the angle. Like oh. this. Oh, like that. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's definitely gonna be down there. It's gonna be so beautiful. I'm gonna whip up the telemetry, listen to her, and you know, kind of give the, the, hey, what's up, 139, we're here, we've arrived. And yeah, for me, it is it is like, well, of course she's not gonna be there. I thought she'd be just right on the other side, but she's probably further along here. Like, of course she's going to defy my expectations and do something that I wasn't, wasn't expecting, because that's just, I mean, one, it seems like that's what she does. And two, it, there is still quite a bit of snow. Where there isn't snow, the vegetation is just beginning to emerge. In response to that, she knows there's good food down canyon. But there's still enough snow for us to cash in on carrying these skis all this way. <laughs> Maybe 139 is not here because of all the guns we brought along. 
So while 139 is gallivanting where the grass is greener, we take a run. Following Deer 139 changed how we think about our landscapes. They're more than just places for us to play, they're places around which wild animals shape their complex and intricate lives. As humans, we each wield some power over the long-term fate of wildlife like 139 and the intact landscapes they need to survive. I think that's deer 139. Yeah. Oh no, no, that's not her. <laughs> that's not her. Before we loaded up and officially ended this journey, Sam listened for 139 one more time. Finally, some beeps. Finally. There she is. Okay. Yeah. Cheers, 139. Cheers, 139. What are you doing up there? Yeah. Mm. Of course we hear from the car. Yeah, I know, typical 139. <laughs> we should have just driven over here. It saved us a lot of time and miles. There goes 139's fun. Feisty little gal. Do you think you broke it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs>